Good morning, everyone. I'm Asha Nayaswamy, and we're continuing with our sheltering in place conversations. So let's begin with a prayer. Heavenly Father, Divine Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswar, Beloved Master Paramhansa Yogananda, Saints of all religions, Divine Friend Swami Kriyananda, humbly we bow to all. Help us to attune ourselves to your inward presence, that we may know your will and act with devotion and courage to be your instruments in this world. Om. Peace. Amen. I've had uh, a number of conversations, well, a lot of conversations over the course of time, but there seems to be a theme that's been coming in, some of the emails and the phone calls I've had with people. And I just wanted to sort of try to talk about some of the issues that have been presented to me. It's it's partly having to do with inner guidance and how to tell what God is really wanting of you. It partly has to do with self-honesty. Uh, it partly has to do with how much renunciation is enough renunciation. It's just a whole lot of issues are all kind of rolled up in together, and I'm just going to try to just point to some pieces of it. You know, over many years I've given a number of classes that we end up usually calling them How to Know and Trust Your Inner Guidance, I think is uh, the the title that we've used if you go onto the uh, YouTube channel, where many of you are probably watching this, and you type that into the little box, you'll find bunches of them. And in the course of talking about inner guidance, I've tried to sort of parse it apart so that we understand that not all inner voices are equal, is the way um, I I like to think about it. When uh, we talk about consciousness, and a lot of these subjects are explored in greater depth, either in this series of sheltering in place or in other channels, in other talks. So I'm just going to make references. We talk about the three levels of conscious, subconscious, conscious, and superconscious. In, In brief, Subconscious is everything that we've already done. It's the storage. It's the storage place for not only all the experiences of this lifetime, but for all the lifetimes before. That's how we're using the word. It's just. It's all there. It's. It's everything up until this moment that has happened to you. That's stored in your chakras. That is. That creates the energy pattern that makes us who we are. The superconscious is our potential. Uh, it, it's actually more accurately, you would say it's our destiny. The superconscious is the inevitable expansion of our awareness until our awareness becomes infinite. How long it's going to take us to achieve that, how eagerly we embrace it, depends on the force of who we are already, and the battleground is the conscious mind. So it depends on how committed we are either to continue with the values and the pleasures that we already have, or whether to expand into this greater potential that our soul is calling us to. And we can just keep running what is essentially subconscious, subconscious because it continues our involvement in self-definition, egoic self-definition, and the material world. Now, as we progress through the awakening process, you might call it, There are stages of our lives where our lives are are just completely dictated by circumstances outside of us. We just obey our parents. We obey our grandparents. Some some cultures, you know, put put tremendous value on obeying um, your elders. Um, Many of the Asian countries, the Indian countries, the Chinese countries, they have they have an attitude toward that even now that is very foreign to Americans. When I was telling a group of Indians about uh, in Bangalore about my meeting Swami, my decision to move to Ananda, when I was I, me- I met him when I was twenty-two, 
And um, they asked me, what did your parents think about it? And I had to answer, I never thought of even asking them. And what they thought about it wouldn't have influenced me. It looked, they were horrified. I just had to shrug my shoulders and say, I'm an American. But honestly, I would have done it no matter what culture I was in, because that was just who I am. But we find in our, um, you know, in our multicultural world that I live in, grandparents in India will be making decisions for six-year-old children in America, you know, for their grandkids, and the generation in between just goes along with it. That has a very positive side and also has a negative side. So I won't, I, this isn't the subject, so I won't go on with it. When I was 18 years old, and let me think, I would have been older, maybe I was 20, I was working in this law office as a secretary. And to just be honest, I was probably about 22. Um, I was working in this law office, and one of the girls in the office was getting married. And a marriage to me seemed like a very personal and private thing that you want to figure out for yourself in your own way. She was basically getting married according to the magazines. And I gradually began to realize that her relationship with her fiancé was pretty much according to the magazines. And I presume that her divorce was also according to the magazines. I, I didn't keep in touch with her. But I have to admit, I was, I was shocked. I was so naive. I was shocked that she had so little interior life and so little sense of her own inner reality that something even as personal as that, she was just surrendering to the mass culture. It was more common than I knew at that time. I've since grown up a little bit. But I was honestly shocked. So in terms of following our inner guidance, the first step we have to do is we have to possess our own lives. We have to take it back from the trends and the fashions and the, and the uh, mass culture and all of that. Swami himself said whenever he found, finds himself cooperating even a little bit with the fad, any fad, he always steps back to re reevaluate uh, he even made the comment once, has made it multiple times, that people who fa follow fashion have no taste of their own. Now, I think that perhaps is a little strong, but they're just asking what's fashionable. I mean, I know from people that I know that a lot of people who follow fashion just do it for fun. And it isn't really like they've surrendered. They just enjoy it. It's a, it's a hobby. But nonetheless, Swami has a point. I remember when I was 15 and beginning, the beatniks were just coming in at that point. I never, I was a little too young to be part of it. I, I was primed to be a hippie, but I missed the beatniks. But when the beatniks began to come in and their style of dress was beginning to influence things, I really realized that because I didn't know about consignment stores, and I, even though I sewed my own clothes, I didn't have that much imagination, um, I, I began to realize that I couldn't, I couldn't wear anything except what was in fashion. I couldn't buy shoes. I couldn't buy dresses. They just, somebody else decided for me what I was supposed to look like. And it began to annoy me very greatly. I began to separate myself starting at that point from mass culture because I wanted to be myself. And that is, that's progress. You know, if, if one has simply been a doormat and allowed everyone else to dictate to you who you should be, it's necessary to listen to one's inner voice. And even if that voice is only subconscious, even if that voice is only egoically asserting its egoic preferences, everything is directional. It's a step up from not even knowing what your egoic preferences are to be able to say, I don't like tuna fish. I want an egg salad sandwich, instead of just letting everybody tell you everything that you have to be. So it is the first step toward inner guidance to just cling to your selfish opinions rather than allowing yourself to just be buffeted by the winds of others' points of view. But if we have a goal of God realization, then we have to begin to sort out among the many inner voices, as I've titled this, who's talking. Because we're not one simple entity. We are these multiple levels, depending on the day of the week and so on. And, and plus, there's even a further point, which is that Master says, thoughts are not individual, they're universal, and we merely tune in to levels of consciousness. So even the thoughts which we call our own, we're actually receiving from, from the, um, what would you call, well, just from the vibrational universe and, and the divine 
the master is always projecting his thoughts, but our subconscious is also busy. And also the dark force, literally the dark force, is also projecting its consciousness. And we're, that's why the conscious mind and our willpower, we're right in, in the middle of all of this. So there is an interesting fact about inner voices. And I remember this from a man who came to Swami and wanted to persuade Swamiji that instead of This man wanted to persuade Swami. Instead of singing Swami's music, this man wanted to sing the music that he'd written himself because it felt right to him. Swami's comment later was that, yes, but it wasn't very good music. (laughs) Meaning, and he said it wasn't very good, not technically, but it wasn't good because the word Swami used was imitative. Even though he felt like he was expressing himself, he was really just imitating what was popular at that time. And when you listen to it, you could see it. I don't know who the singers were at that time who were popular, but it was just all in that same style. His own words, his own sequence of notes. But it, it didn't really represent what Swami talks about is coming from your own point of origin. He said to be original is not to be different. To be original is to come from your own point of origin. And Swami uses as an example to illustrate that, he said the words, I love you, are about as like ordinary as words can possibly be. And a person could say, I love you. But there's no, it, you, you can tell, it's just a superficial statement. It's not, it doesn't come from the depths. It doesn't go all the way back to their origin point of self. But someone who says, I love you, From the origin point, it has a completely different power, same words, same melody even, but have a completely different power from your origin point. Now, getting back to our origin point, that's what the whole spiritual path is about. It's about having having the determination, and and, and the word has to be self-honesty, and self-honesty means humility. Um and the willpower, and the energy, and the concentration. There's a lot of things that are required here to constantly um, be introspecting and discerning and paying attention to the consequences so that we can gradually, and believe me, this is gradual, this is the whole spiritual path, so that we can gradually understand who I am, why I feel the way I do, where my suffering is come from, coming from, why I react or respond to the world in the way I do, so that then I can begin to make actual informed conscious choices. On the battle of Kurukshetra, between everything that's always been and everything that is my destiny, I stand on the field of Kurukshetra, which is the field of my conscious awareness, and I need to know what's going on here. So going back to this man, who is a very, very good musician, um, Swami really wanted him to immerse himself in the music that Swami had written. Swami himself said, the phrase he used was, it's a bit awkward, he said, because I am the composer. So here I am recommending the music that I have written, as opposed to the music that you have written. And it's easy to imagine it to be just a conflict of egoic preferences. But, you know, Swami didn't explain at that point because he didn't have to explain it to me. But the music that Swamiji has been the channel for, because Swami said himself, I never consider it my music. He said it was given to me. It represents a, a, a vibration of consciousness that's in tune with this particular ray of grace that, that is our line of gurus. And for those of us who are on this path, who are disciples, the more deeply we can get in tune with the vibrations of that ray, the more powerfully, the more effectively we'll be able to discern between that which is in harmony with that ray and will therefore take us toward our own potential and that which is just merely our own energy just spinning and and therefore is not going to help us. It's not that our own energy, our own preferences, our own personalities, our own talents, our tastes, there's nothing wrong with them inherently. It's not like we're trying to suppress who we are. Uh, and this, this, there's this, the, the ego is not your enemy. The ego is just one of the soldiers in your army. 
And the ego has to, we all have egos, and we, what we have to learn to do is we have to learn to, to direct the ego in such a way that it will lead us toward superconsciousness instead of keeping us always embroiled in its own limited sense of self. So many of the talents and desires and impulses that we have are actually part of the necessary karmic trajectory to help us realize our potential. The the ancient, the old Catholic way of doing it was that we suppressed all self-expression. We suppressed all self-will. We even suppressed our common sense and let just others take over for us. But Swamiji repudiates that. That's not really the self-realization way. But that doesn't mean, therefore, that everything we feel should also be honored because there are many voices within us speaking. We have to know who's talking and we have to know why they're talking and then we have to make a conscious choice as to whether or not to listen to them. We have to stand in superconsciousness, survey the field and decide. So this young man who really wanted to sing his own music was talking about how just basically how in tune he felt with that idea. In fact, what he wanted to do was to leave the ashram, which he did, so that he could write and and sing his own music, which never happened. He did leave the ashram, but he was never able to bring it to a focus. Swami was very sad about it. He said, in what he'd advised him, he said, if you immerse yourself in the music that has come through me, it will make you more in tune with this ray of grace. And the more in tune you get with that ray of grace, the closer you'll come to your own origin point. And then whatever creative inspiration comes to you will will come from your origin point and won't be imitative. It'll be you. Even if the genre resembles other genres, it'll have a different power because it'll come from you. But the man says, why does this decision feel so right to me? to leave and to do this. Swamiji, I don't recall that he answered at the time, but I thought about it later and I thought, because he's enclosed himself in what is already familiar to him and there's nothing to create dissonance. So a lot of times our inner voices sound right to us. Of course they sound right to us because it's my voice telling me what I want. And sometimes, with all due respect, people who give you like a psychic reading will read you. They won't necessarily read your superconscious potential like a guru can do. They'll just read you. And they'll tell you what's roiling around inside of you. And then, lo and behold, they confirm it. Like, what a surprise. (laughs) Because this is what you are right now. But a guru will know what you are right now and try to find a way to lead you to what you can become. So, Now, bringing it back to some of the dilemmas I've been sort of working with people a little bit in the last couple of weeks, it's like, here we are, and there's there's so many different voices ringing in our minds. A friend was talking to me about the sort of this um, very complicated family matter and the sense of responsibility that they needed to go in and sort of make this right and finish the karma with certain people in their family and get it all straightened out. But the more they described the situation to me, I mean, it was was pure wishful thinking, just absolutely pure, 100% wishful thinking. There wasn't a shred of practical potential. There There wasn't the power within the person and there wasn't the circumstances it was going to allow it. It was a complete suicide mission. I had a friend once who brought to me a very complicated romantic mess, you know, that had just been going on for years and so on. And so they came to me and they wanted counseling for me because they wanted me to help them finish the karma. I said, well, honey, you're going to have to find another counselor because I don't see a chance in the world that you're going to finish this karma. We'll be lucky if we can progress it a little. Because it's just too complicated. There's too much going on. Pure, wishful thinking. We can do our best, but there's not going to be any absolute resolution here. So what I've seen, there are multiple things that I've seen when people feel really confused about which voice to follow, what voice is speaking. First is wishful thinking. And and what... I mean, positive thinking is as Swami puts it, is realistically assessing what the situation is 
and then then finding something positive that you can do that you know will at least advance your own consciousness, if nothing else. I'm not really explaining that very well. But wishful thinking is is refusing to accept what is and just thinking that if I just keep, you know, trying, it's going to be different this time. You know, that this is the door is over there, but I'm just going to throw myself against this wall. And maybe by the 50th time I do it, the wall will turn into a door. But there's no, uh, there's no factual basis for it. We are resisting what God has imposed upon us. Because things don't always work out. And karma does not come out tidy. Especially if that karma involves other people. Or circumstances, which of course it almost always does. You know, ultimately all the karma is just our own inner attitude and the dissonance, the fear, the anxiety, the worry that circumstances create, the actual karma is not those circumstances. The karma is the fact that those circumstances can trigger dissonance within us. Because all karma is internal. You know, the, the past memory of when somebody shot you in the head and buried your body and stole your money I like that body is long since dead. The money is long since gone. But there's a dissonance within you. So when you meet your murder in this life, you have a profound distrust of them and an unra- irrational desire to have revenge on them for reasons you don't even remember. Master said sometimes karmic enemies are built and in, born into the same family. I had this poor woman confess to me that she had actually twins. One was a boy, one was a girl. The girl was a dear friend from old lifetimes, and the boy was an enemy. And from the first, from the very first, she had an aversion to one and an affection for the other. My, my, that was a hard, that was a hard incarnation for her. Master said, sometimes enemies are born into the same families to fight it out in close quarters. But that doesn't mean it will resolve. That just means something will happen. (laughs) So in ourselves, I've, I speak of wishful thinking as being, being an obstacle to clear guidance, but wishful thinking is always tied to fear. Fear is often tied to ego in an interesting way. I should be good enough to be able to do this. If I just expand my heart, if I just say it in the right way, if I'm just you know detached enough, if I just have enough spiritual power, if I just pray enough, and sometimes in a very weird way where we're really operating from a very egoic place in thinking that what makes you think you're that good what makes you think you're the you're the emperor of the universe and can declare that you will learn your lesson and we will be in harmony maybe he or she has absolutely no interest in learning this lesson i remember a discussion i had with an elderly relative And I was urging upon them some particular course of action. And I said what to me seemed so self-evident. Don't you want to grow? And they replied to me, no, just like that. No. It was a horrifying prospect to grow because they'd suffered a lot in the last years of their life. And they were not looking for more challenges. They were just looking to sort of basically last till the end with as little suffering as possible. How? Why did I not think of that? Am I the emperor of the universe that dictates to everyone what they're supposed to do? Do I actually even have the power to dissolve and change my own karma? What to speak of making that person change? So humility is self-honesty. And a lot of times when we're very confused about what we're supposed to do, it's because we have this inflated idea of who I should be without having the honesty to realize who I actually am. I'm just not that good. I'm not that powerful. I'm not that interested in being that good. I'm not capable of being that good. And honestly, I don't really love that much. One of my friends, Swami, urged her to... She wasn't getting along with someone, and Swami said, Oh, he just wants to be your friend. (laughs) She replied, His friend? She said, I don't even want to be in the same room with him. (laughs) I mean, it was honest. It was like, no, I, I don't love that much. And therefore, I have to be realistic. I can't just think about wishful thinking. I have to be realistic. 
And so what the other part of it about self-honesty is, and really this is the way to think about it, where do I actually fall on the spectrum of renunciation? How much of my comfort, how much of many of my desires, how many of my longings, how much of my ego? Am I really interested in renouncing? In other words, what is my actual true nature? Who am I? And then why am I afraid? What am I afraid of? I started to say, why am I afraid to admit who I am? But but whenever we're confused about God's will, at least let me phrase it differently. In my experience, whenever I am whenever I am confused about God's will, it's because I'm afraid of something. And often I'm afraid of what might be his will. It's going to be too contradictory to my own. And that fear, instead of just admitting how afraid I am and unwilling I am to accept God's will, because that doesn't suit my self-image over here, um, I just pretend I don't know what he wants. (laughs) Because if I don't know, then I can still maintain my self-image that I would be willing if he just told me. I remember once I was in a great state of confusion like that. I put this story in Swami Kriyananda as we have known him. And I was saying it's so hard to know God's will. I said that to Swamiji. He said, no, it's not. I said, for me it is. And then when I meditated on it, I said, because you don't want to know. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. No, actually you don't, because you're afraid. Oh, fear. I know that one. So what am I afraid of? And ever since, that has been my way of really coming to understand who's talking to me. What am I afraid of? And ideas will come to you right away, but don't take them too quickly. Or if you take it, say, why am I afraid of that? What does that mean to me? What is behind that fear? And we just keep, to my experience, to just keep unraveling those levels of fear gradually sorts out everything else that's going on. Because fear fear is the opposite of love, essentially. St. Paul in the Bible says, perfect love casts out all fear. So whenever there is fear, there is a lack of love, a lack of love for humanity, a lack of love for yourself, a lack of love for God. So whenever there's anxiety, there's a lack of love. Why am I unable to love? Because fear is blocking me. And in one of the letters I received recently, the the, the person kept saying, kept calling their own attitude silly. I I don't think that's a good idea. Don't call yourself silly or stupid. We've spent a very long time developing the understandings that we have. And if we're trying for truth now, none of our delusions are silly. we, We acquired them with good intention. They're not helpful, but they're powerful. And when we call them silly, we often don't respect them enough to do battle in the right way. We just think we can dismiss them, and that's part of our fear. We, we just want to dismiss them. We don't want to realize how deeply invested I really am in this attitude. But then when we realize how deeply invested we are, then we can begin to approach it in a way that will eventually free us and move us into superconsciousness. You know, none of this is easy, but all of it... Let me... what. All of it is wonderful. One, because it's fascinating, and it's the only work worth doing, and it will bring us to everything that we want. So rather than being dismayed when we find ourselves in states of great confusion, be extremely interested. Just be interested. Just be interested in who I am really, and why I feel the way I feel, and then most deeply, how with God's grace I can become free. God bless you all.